Hello, this is David Hardman, and this is the first screencast in the series Introduction to Cognitive Psychology, in which I'm going to focus on some of the early psychologists who these days we would consider to be uh, cognitive psychologists. Uh, but before I do that, I'm just going to ask the question, what actually is cognition? Cognition essentially refers to internal states and episodes. Now it may seem really obvious to say that when we're uh, thinking, remembering and so forth, um, there are things going on inside, but for a part of the 20th century researchers actually wanted to focus on only things that could be externally observed. Uh, now we'll be coming to that in a later screencast, but uh, cognitive psychology takes a different view. It says to understand people, you really know, need to know about uh, internal states and episodes that are happening. And uh, also, uh, it's assumed that these are not somehow supernatural, but these are uh, physically embodied. In humans and animals, uh, this is embodied in the brain and nervous system. Um, some people think, though, that uh, computers potentially could be intelligent in uh, similar ways to us. OK, so here's a couple of early figures. Ernst Weber and Gustav Fechner. Uh, they worked in a discipline which is known as psychophysics. And this is concerned with people's ability to distinguish between stimuli of different strengths. And together, well, independently, I should say, they actually came up with something we call the Weber-Fechner law. They'd observed that, for instance, a person might be able to distinguish between a 100 gram weight and a 102 gram weight, a difference of 2 grams, but would be unable to distinguish between a 200 gram weight and a 202 gram weight, also a difference of 2 grams. But that person might be able to distinguish between a 200 gram weight and a 204 gram weight. So by looking at uh, people's ability to distinguish between these uh, different uh, pairs of weights or um, you know, other kinds of stimuli, Weber and Fechner observed that there was actually a kind of regularity that they could describe with an equation. And this equation is the Weber-Fechner law. Hermann von Helmholtz um, was interested in the processes of visual perception. Uh, he'd actually looked at the structure of the human eye, and he regarded it as rather optically poor. And he thought that in order for us to um, perceive all the things that we do, there must be um, mental transformations going on of the raw stimuli that we receive from the environment. And uh, much of this, he thought, was unconscious. Uh, he said, we make unconscious inferences when we perceive things. Um, an example of this would be the way in which we assume that light comes from above. So when you go to the pictures, for example, and you see a horror movie, often you see people's faces lit from below. And it makes them look really strange and scary because that's not what we normally uh, expect. We expect light to come from above. Uh, a key figure in the research of human memory is Hermann Ebbinghaus. And uh, Ebbinghaus used himself as a research subject. Um, and this graph shows uh, the results from uh, one of his studies in which he tried to learn lists of nonsense syllables. So he would repeat these uh, syllables over and over again to himself until he completely uh, learned the list. Then he would come back to it a little bit later, either at a short interval later or, or at a longer interval later. And of course, he would have forgotten some of the list. And so he would repeat it again. And he was interested in how many repetitions would be needed to completely relearn the list. But what this graph shows is that very quickly after initial learning, a lot of information is actually forgotten. So the forgetting curve shows us that um, 
we forget information very rapidly uh, shortly after learning but then it kind of plateaus out a little bit the rate of forgetting uh, slows down a couple of other uh, people in fact Wilhelm Wundt here is really one of the key figures in the sense that he was the first person to set up a dedicated psychological laboratory some of these other people that we've been just just been looking at uh, might have worked in universities but not actually in something that was called uh, a school of psychology they were in other kinds of departments so in 1879 Wundt was the first person to set up a dedicated psychological laboratory this was in Germany at the University of Leipzig Wundt himself was uh, very interested in the processes underlying conscious well, immediate conscious experience uh, he thought that immediate conscious experience was based on uh, sensations and the feelings that were associated with those sensations he also thought that ideas were involved in conscious experience but a rather less immediate form of conscious experience and his research uh, used a method that we still use a lot these days which was to look at people's reaction times to uh, certain stimuli uh, this method had actually been, involved, been, been developed by another uh, person Franciscus Donders who called this mental chronometry but the basic idea is that certain internal uh, processes uh, take longer than others and we can get some idea about that by simply measuring people's reaction times to uh, to certain stimuli so uh, by looking at how long people take to do something we can then make inferences about uh, their internal cognitive processes Wundt called his uh, particular brand of psychology voluntarism although in textbooks he's often described as a structuralist and the reason for this is because his student Edward Titchener uh, took Wundt's psychology to the United States where he set up his own laboratory um, and he called uh, this kind of psychology structuralism so Titchener was also interested in uh, conscious experience but he went about looking at it in a slightly different way he used something that's called the introspective method uh, whereby people are asked to verbally report on their own internal processes so for example a person who's looking at a chair would not simply say I can see a chair that would have been regarded as a bit of a mistake but they might say things like well the fabric has a certain quality of redness and uh, it's not a, uh, a glossy texture but rather more of a matte kind of texture and uh, you know the chair's got a certain rigidity to it and so on and so Titchener regarded all of these kind of elements of perception as adding up to one big perception like a jigsaw you put all the pieces together in order to see the bigger picture uh, this methodology did fall into some disrepute unfortunately because um, uh, psychologists working in other departments using this method found that their participants often reported different things when they were uh, looking at the same kind of stimuli um, and in particular there was a big argument over whether thoughts were always accompanied by images uh, some people reported having thoughts where there weren't actually any uh, images associated with them and there was really no way to resolve this dispute and so the introspective method really kind of fell by the wayside, wayside eventually okay so that's it for this screencast in the next one we'll be looking at a couple of other schools of psychology and these are Gestalt psychology and functionalism so I'll see you then